Nothing? Okay. We were talking about measures of location last time, which is sort of the ultimate reduction of a list of numbers to a single number that in some sense best represents the list. And different notions of what it means to represent a list best lead to different measures of location. <clears throat> the mean represents the list best in the sense that if you sum the squares of the deviations, the differences between the numbers in the list and the mean, that sum of square differences is smaller than the sum of square differences between the elements of the list and any other number. The mean makes that sum of square deviations smallest. The median is not, a, is not the unique solution to the following problem, but it is a solution to the following problem. What minimizes the sum of the absolute values of the deviations? So the sum of the absolute values of the differences between the numbers in the list and the median of the list is uh, smaller or at least no, is as small as it can possibly be. Now, the last example we did last time was an example of a gambling game where you roll a die and uh, what you, are, you are paid something that sort of decreases the larger the absolute value of the difference between a number that you guess and the number that shows up on the die is. And I said that the median, minim, the me median would maximize what you get paid. Would, you'd, you'd have the least subtracted from what you get paid if you pick the median, if you're trying to minimize the sum of the absolute values. Um, the, the, the median minimizes that, but any number between three and four in that example uh, minimizes that. The median is three, it's one of the minimizers, but they all give the same, all give the same value. The other notion of what's typical for a list is the mode. What the mode minimizes is the number of observations that differ from it at all. Among all numbers that you could pick, the number that minimizes the number of elements in the list that are not equal to it is a mode of the list. And a list can have more than one mode, okay, just the most common value. <coughs> right, so those are summaries of what's typical for a list. It's an ultimate reduction of an entire list of numbers to one number. One number is not going to do a very good job of characterizing a long list of numbers. So we want to look at expanding that description with other summaries of the list. So the mean is a measure of what's typical. The next thing you might think about is, well, typically, how far off is, is what's, you know, are elements of the list from what's typical for the list? So if you have a measure of location, it says what's typical, but we know that e not everything is going to be equal to that number, typically. No pun intended there. Um, so the question is, how wrong is it likely to be? How, how unrepresentative of the list is the most representative thing likely to be? And we're going to look at measures of that. Those are measures of spread or variability. They talk about sort of how different, how, how big are differences among the numbers? How much do they tend to differ from what's typical? So why does that matter? Why should you care about the variability of a list? Well, here's a little hypothetical example. It comes from a, a lovely book by Hook called uh, How to Tell the uh, Statisticians from the Liars, I believe, if I remember correctly. So he has a hypothetical example where you have three mechanical golfers. Um, I'm not a golfer, but I understand that the point of golf is to get a low score. Um, so here's golfer one. And golfer one, mechanical golfer, always scores a 72. No matter what happens, always scores a 72. Golfer two, mechanical golfer two, scores a 69 25% of the time and a 73 75% of the time. Okay? On average, what does golfer do, golfer two do? Well, 25% of 69 plus 75% of 73 turns out to be 72 again. So on average, golfer one and golfer two do the same. Okay, their, their average score is the same. Golfer three gets a 70 half the time and a 74 half the time. Again, golfer three's average is a 72. So if you wanted to summarize how these golfers did by a single number, on average they're the same. Okay. What happens when they play each other? So on average they're the same. What happens when golfer two plays golfer one? OK, golfer two wins whenever golfer two gets a 69. Golfer two loses whenever golfer two gets a 73. Right? So golfer two is going to lose 75% of the time. OK, what happens when golfer three
plays golfer two. Sorry? 50-50 chance of winning or losing? Is that true? Okay, we need an extra assumption here, which is that um, in some sense their scores don't depend on each other. The, the technical assumption is independence, which we'll talk about later when we're doing probability. But um, we, we know that uh, what happens, okay, so we've got golfer one beats golfer two 75% of the time. Golfer two, what happens when golfer two beats, plays golfer three? Certainly, whenever golfer two gets a 69, golfer two wins because that's lower than all of the scores that golfer three can get, okay? But when golfer three, when golfer two scores a 73, that's, that's still lower than a 74. Right? So if, if golfer three, if golfer two gets a 73 and golfer three gets a 74, golfer two still wins. Right? Sorry? Am I saying it right? Yeah, okay. Um, all right. So how often is that going to happen? Well, again, this independence thing comes in, which we're not going to talk about very much. But basically, if these scores don't have anything to do with each other, then of the times that golfer two scores a 73, Half the time golfer three gets a 70, half the time golfer three gets a 74. That's what independence means, okay? So of the times golfer two gets a 73, half of those times golfer two is gonna win. Okay, so golfer two is gonna win 25% of the time plus half of 75% of the time. Does that make sense? Okay, half of 75 is what? 37 and a half plus 25. 62.5% of the time, something like that. I can't add, you know, occupational hazard, especially on TV. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so golfer one beats golfer two 75% of the time. Golfer two beats golfer three 62.5% of the time, right? More than half the time. What happens when golfer three plays golfer one? They play even, right? Okay. So <laughs> um, he beats him, he beats him, they play even. Right? Variability matters. That's, that's the point here. You can't tell what's going to happen just from knowing how they play on average. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So here, kind of pictorially, are histograms of three different fictitious data sets that all have mean and median equal to zero, all right? So here we've got three modes, right? Uh, minus two, zero, and two are the modes of the histogram. We don't know what the modes of the original list are, but this balance is at zero, right? That's the balance point of this. So the mean of the underlying list is, is roughly zero. The mean of the histogram is exactly zero, right? These numbers are kind of spread out. Here's another example of a histogram of some data, balances at zero again, yep. I mean, it's zero, but the data look very different. The distribution is very different. Here's another example. All the numbers are zero, right? These are, this is least spread out of all. The first one was sort of most spread out. Middle one was in between. This is the least spread out. They all have the same mean. You couldn't tell them apart from just a single number representation of what's going on. We need some measure of how spread out the histogram is as well, what its shape is. This okay with everyone, I trust. All right, so we're going to talk, we talked about three measures of location. We're going to talk about three measures of variability or spread. Um, we mentioned that the mean is not a resistant measure of location. You can make the mean be whatever you want it to be by changing just one number. The range is, and the SD are also not resistant. You can make the range really, really big by changing just one number. You can make the SD really, really big by just changing one number. The IQR is resistant. It's more like the median in the sense that you would have to corrupt a lot of the data in order to change it by a lot. <clears throat> All right, what is the range? Well, the range is simply the largest observation minus the smallest observation. It is the range. Now, many of us think of a range as being something like 0 to 15, 
the, that is a range in English, but the range in statistics it would, for that would just be 15, largest minus smallest. Okay, so the range is not a range, it is a number. The interquartile range, the IQR, is just the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. So it's the width of an interval that you need to capture the middle 50% of the data, right? With the upper quartile, 25% of the data are beyond that. Lower quartile, 25% of the data are below it. So the range between the 25th and 75th captures the middle 50% of the data. The question is, what's the width of that interval? The upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So it's the, it's the width of an interval that includes the middle 50% of the data. <clears throat> the SD, um, this is where we're going to butt up against uh, things that you might have learned in a different class. Um, so time to, time to pay special attention. Um, the, the standard deviation is the root mean square of the deviations of the list from the mean of the list. Uh, we need to define what root mean square RMS is in order to, in order to do that. And the difference that you're going to see if you've taken statistics before, you, you might have been taught that the standard deviation involves dividing by n minus 1. That's a different critter called the sample standard deviation. And we'll talk about that later. It's used to estimate certain things. Here we're talking about just summarizing a list of numbers. Standard deviation, what's going to be in the denominator is just n, not n minus 1. All right, so what is the root mean square? It's the square root of the mean of the squares, okay, root of the mean of the squares. So if you have a list of numbers, the RMS of the list is how you get it, you, 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 take, you square the numbers in the list, you take the squares, you take the mean of the squares, you divide that sum of squares, you, you add up all the squares, you divide by how many numbers there are in the list, and then you take the square root of that. So you've got the root of the mean of the squares. <clears throat> it is a measure of how large an element of the list typically is. Uh, you could have a list of numbers that has a mean of zero, right? If you add all the numbers up, you get zero. You add them all up, divide by n, you get zero. And nonetheless, none of the numbers is zero. The numbers could be quite big in magnitude. Some large positive numbers could balance some large negative numbers and cause the mean to be zero, right? So this is a way of removing the sign from the elements of the list so you get an overall summary of how large they are. It's not the only way of doing that. You could, for example, add the absolute values or average the absolute values of the numbers in the list. Or you could average the fourth powers of the numbers in the list or whatever you want, something to just sort of get rid of the signs so that negative numbers and positive numbers don't cancel each other. This is one way of doing it. It's the root mean square. <clears throat> OK, so just a you know, quick, quick example. If we had a list of five data, minus 1, minus 5, 0, 5, 1. Um, they, are, they are written that way. It is obvious that the mean is zero, right? Because the minus 5 and plus 5 cancel, the minus 1 and plus 1 cancel, leaving all zeros. So the mean of that's going to be zero. Uh, but typically, how big are the elements of the list? Well, I'm, I mean, they're typically somewhere between 1 and 5. And we could summarize that in a variety of different ways. If we use the RMS to do it, what do we do? We square each element of the list. We add those squares together, divide by how many there are. That gives us the mean of the squares. And then we take the square root of that to get the root of the mean of the squares. And it turns out to be 3.2 for that list. All right. <clears throat> OK, what's the SD of the list, of a list? Well, we take the list of numbers and we turn it into a list of deviations from the mean. From each number in the list, we subtract the mean of the list. That gives the deviation of that element of the list from the mean, OK? So um, that then the standard deviation is the RMS of that list, that list of deviations from the mean. So if we had a list of numbers like this, 630241, to find the standard deviation, first we'd find the mean of the list. We average the numbers in the list. That's 2.67. Then we make a new list, the list of deviations from the mean. So from the first element of the list, 6, we subtract the mean. From the second element of the list, we subtract the mean, et cetera. Okay. So what does that give us? It gives us this list of six numbers. First element, of the element minus the mean of the list gives us 3.33. Second element minus the mean gives us 0.33, et cetera. And now 
from this list of deviations from the mean, we get the standard deviation by taking the RMS of this, this list. So what is that? We average the squares and take the square root. So we're going to square each of these things, divide by the number of things there are, add them together, add by how many there are. That's the mean of the squares, and then take the square root of that. So the standard deviation of this list is 1.97, plus or minus round off. OK? So what is this telling us? It's giving us an idea of, on average, how far away is an element of the list from the mean of the list, where what far away means is the square of the difference. Okay, we're sort of we're looking at the the, the 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 square root of the average squared distance from the mean. So, if every number were equal to the mean, if all the numbers were equal, what would the standard deviation be? Zero, right? Because all the numbers are equal to the mean. If all the numbers are equal, they are all equal to the mean, right? Because you add up a bunch of things that are all equal to each other and divide by how many there are, you get back what you started with. Yes? OK. So if they're all equal, they're all equal to the mean. If you subtract e each of them, if you subtract the mean from each of them, you get a list of zeros. If you square the zeros, you get zero. If you average the zeros, you get zero. And then if you take the square root, you get zero, right? So the standard deviation is going to be zero. OK, if all the numbers are equal, the SD is zero. <clears throat> Um, what happens to the interquartile range if all the numbers are equal? It's, all, it's also zero, right? So it, the, if, if, if all the numbers are equal, then the lower quartile is that one value that they all take. The upper quartile is that one value that they all take. And the difference between those two numbers is zero. Yes. If all the numbers are equal, the range is zero as well. Right. <clears throat> um, if the interquartile range is zero, does it follow that all the numbers are equal? No. So that's that's a one-way entailment. If all the numbers are equal, the IQR is zero. But if the IQR is zero, then all the numbers don't have to be equal because it's not telling you what's happening with that lower 25 percent and upper 25 percent of the list. Right. <clears throat> Um, in fact, they could be arbitrarily different. If the range is zero, are all the numbers equal? Yeah, the smallest, the largest minus the smallest is zero. That means they're all they're all between the same number and the same number. Right. Uh, what about the standard deviation? The standard deviation is zero. Are all the numbers equal? Yeah. Okay. Because when you when you square the deviations, you only get positive things. So when you add up a bunch of things that, that, are, that can't be negative, if you end up getting 0, then every single one of those things must be 0. So all of the deviations from the mean must be 0. Therefore, all of the numbers must be equal to the mean. Therefore, all the numbers are equal to each other. Right. <clears throat> OK. Yeah? This one? Doesn't this one do Friday? OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Um, OK, affine transformations, um, measures of location and spread behave in a very predictable way when you, trans when you change units, when you, when you change sort of the units of measurement. Um, a lot of different scales are related to each other by multiplication by a constant and adding a constant. So, for example, uh, the conversion between inches and feet is of that kind. A value in inches is 12 times the value in feet. Uh, conversion between Fahrenheit and centigrade is like that. The, the temperature in Fahrenheit is a constant times the temperature in centigrade plus a constant. Okay, Conver conversion between different units of measurement of the same kind of thing uh, typically behave this way. It's a, you know, it's a constant times it plus a shift. Shift might be zero. A relationship like this is called affine. It's the equation of a straight line. You might have heard of it as a linear relation. In math, linear means something just slightly different. Relation is, is linear if um, a function f is linear if f of x plus y is f of x plus f of y and f of a constant times x is a constant times f of x. This doesn't satisfy that. Okay, this is this is this is linear plus a constant. That's affine. 
All right. Um, if you change variables so that uh, by an affine transformation, you do a change of units from inches to feet or centimeters to miles or gallons to liters or something like that that's an affine transformation, then you don't have to recompute the, 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 the mean, median, mode, range, all, all these things. That there's simple relationships between what the values are going to be in the old units and the new units. Um, so for example, if you, uh, the, the mode of the transformed list, you, if you imagine that sort of, you know, here, here's your list of numbers, you are scaling them, you're multiplying them by a constant and you're shifting them right or left. Okay, what happens to the mode? Well, you just, there is some particular value in the list that is the mode. When you scale and shift, you've just moved that by exactly the same amount. The mode just, it, it, it just moves with the change of variables. Same thing happens to the mean. <clears throat> um, same thing happens to the median if you are multiplying by a positive number. If you're multiplying by a negative number because the median is the smallest number that's at least as big as 50% of the data, if you multiply by a negative number, you're sort of reflecting the list, right? And so now the smallest number that's at least as big as half the data might shift you by one. Yes, depending on whether there's an odd number of, of points or an even number of points. Um, and depending on whether there's more than one point equal to the median. All right, um, the, the range, if you, the, the range doesn't depend on shifting. If I take, if I add the same number to every element of a list, the range of what I get is the same because I'm adding it to the largest value and I'm adding it to the smallest value. When I subtract them, that shift cancels out. Okay, I'm still just getting the difference between them. Um, so when I, if I multiply the range by a constant and add a constant to it, the effect on the range is simply to multiply the range by the absolute value of the constant. If I multiply by minus one, the range is the same. It doesn't change it. <clears throat> Standard deviation behaves similarly. Because I'm taking the deviations from the mean, if I add the same number to every element of the list, the mean changes by that much, by the same amount. And so when I subtract the mean from the new element of the list, the transformed element of the list, I'm subtracting that shift B. It ends up not changing anything. Um, so the effect on the standard deviation of an affine transformation is to multiply the standard de deviation by the absolute value of that multiplicative constant that you're using. <clears throat> And uh, the interquartile range have the same issue that we do with the median. So if A is positive, then uh, the IQR, the transform list, is just A times the IQR, the old list. If A is negative, you have to, it, it could change a little bit because, again, the 75th percentile and 25th percentile could be a little bit different from what they were because when you reflect it, you might have to go to the next element of the list to capture 25%. Does this make sense? No, excuse me. Any questions? <laughs> All right, so measures of variability or spread are telling you how different the numbers in the list are from typical. Measures of location tell you what's typical. Measures of location and spread say how big are the differences typically from what's typical. How much variability is there? <clears throat> okay, this you probably haven't seen before, Markov's inequality and Chebyshev's inequality. Um, these are lovely math facts that hold for lists of numbers. Markov's inequality holds for lists of numbers if, if every element of the list is greater than or equal to zero. Chebyshev's inequality holds for any list whatsoever. Um, we are going to come across analogs of these inequalities later on for probability distributions when we get, when we get to probability and random variables. Um, well, let me, just, let me just talk about what they are. We, we, we mentioned when talking about the, the mean that uh, you know, a light person on a seesaw can balance a heavy person if the light person sits far away from the fulcrum, right? If you sit really far out and the other person is close in, the heavy person is close in, then a light person can balance a heavy one. Well, if we know that um, 
the, the, the person on one end can't be any further away from the fulcrum than a certain amount. We know that they've got their back to a wall, basically. That tells us something about how far away a light person could be sitting, or that, the, that, that if, if a person that were sitting very, very far away weighed very much, this, would, this couldn't balance. This person would be up. Okay? So by, if this person has their back to a wall, then we can learn something about how, how big a person could be sitting how far away and have this still balance. All right, so that, that's what Markov's inequality is telling us. Let's make it quantitative. It's basically this. If, if you have a list of numbers and none of the numbers is negative and the mean of the list is m, then the fraction of numbers in the list that are greater than or equal to x can't be any bigger than the mean of the list divided by x. And this is true for all numbers, all, all, all numbers x. It's not very useful unless x is bigger than 1. Because otherwise, you're saying that the fraction is, uh, you know, the fraction is less, less than something uh, that's bigger than 100%, right? So not, not helpful. Okay. <clears throat> um, sorry, it's not useful unless x is bigger than the mean. Otherwise, you're saying that it's less than or equal to something that's not, not helpful. Okay, so this is really turning into math that intuition about if the back's against the wall, then you couldn't have a very big person very, very, very far out because this person it wouldn't balance anymore at the, at the fulcrum. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in how to derive it, there's a, it's in here. All right, when is this useful? Well, if we have, if, if we know that from first principles that some list can't have any negative numbers, and we'd like to get some idea of how many extreme values, how many large values there could be, we can use Markov's inequality to limit that. Okay, we won't know what the exact answer is, but we can get a bound on it. So let's suppose that there's 200 students in a class. Um, on average, they have 15 bucks in their pocket. How many could have $75 or more? Okay, so I'm assuming that nobody is carrying around debt in their pocket, right? That the amount of money in your pocket is at least zero, yes? So we have a list of 200 numbers that's at, each number is at least zero. We know that the average of the numbers is 15. How many of the numbers could be bigger than 75? Okay. Well, um, to Markov's inequality says the fraction that have 75 or more in their pockets, that's the fraction that's, that's greater than or equal to x, is less than or equal to the mean of the list divided by x, okay? which in this case is 0 0.2, 20%. 5 times 15 is 75. All right, heuristically, what's going on? I have, I have this seesaw. Here is the balance point, uh, the fulcrum here. This is, this is at $15. And I'm asking how much stuff could be out here above $75. Yep. How do I put as much stuff as possible out here and have this still balance at $15? Okay. Is it heuristically clear that I'm going to do that by that there, there are two things that, that we need to get to get to Markov's inequality. One is the idea that if I want to put as much as possible out here and have it still balance at 15, I should actually put it right here at 75 and not bigger. Because if I put it at someplace bigger than 75, it's going to have even more leverage. Right? So if I put a dollar here, that's going to have less effect on the mean than putting a dollar here. Putting a person here, putting a person there. Does this make sense? OK. The second thing is that if I want to balance as big a possible weight at 75, and I can't go below zero, then I'm going to put everything that isn't there, I'm going to put over here at zero. Right? That gives it the most ability to balance what's out, what's out there. So I'm going to have something here, and I'm going to have the rest there. Does that make sense? OK. So that's basically all there is to proving Markov's inequality. I mean, you need to make it rigorous. But what is that going to give us? So we know that whatever is here, 
what should we, well, let's, let's give it a symbolic name. Um, shall we call it, uh, let's, let's call the fraction that's out here at $75, let's call that F. And let's call what's at 0, 1 minus F, right? Because together it's 100%. So far, so good. What is the mean of this list of numbers if we have fraction 1 minus F at 0 and a fraction F at 75? Okay, so the, the, the average of the list, if we want, let, if we want, do we want to give the list a number of elements in order to be talking about a list of numbers rather than a fraction of numbers? Is that, you know? All right, so let's say that there's N, well, in this case, there's 200 students in all. So there's 200 students spread somewhere on this seesaw. So there's a fraction 1 minus F times 200 are at 0 and F times 200 are at 75, right? In this most extreme case that allows us to, to put $75 in as many pockets as possible, the way we do that is by putting $75 in a bunch of people's pockets and $0 in everybody else's. Yes? Okay. So what's the mean of this, of this list now? We've got 200 times 1 minus F people at 0 times zero dollars, right? Plus 200 times F people at 75 times 75 dollars. Yes? All right, so the mean is equal to zero times one minus F times 200 plus 75 times F times 200 divided by 200. Right? Okay, that's all zero. That cancels that. The mean is equal to 75 times F. Okay, what do we know the mean to be? It's $15, right? So we've got, can you see this? Is this my, am I, on, am I still writing to the audience or is this hidden from people? You'll be able to see it. So 15 is equal to 75 times F. F is equal to 0.2, right, one-fifth. That, that's where this number 20% is coming from. That, that's, that's where Markov's inequality is coming from. If I had more than a fifth of the people at $75 or more, with $75 or more in their pockets, there is no way that this thing could balance at $15 without some people having less than nothing in their pockets. And we've ruled that out. Okay? Um, so Markov's inequality is useful if you know that the elements of the list can't be negative, and you know something about the mean, or you would like to infer something about the mean. Right. Chebyshev's inequality doesn't require that, but it, require, it doesn't require non-negativity, but it requires that you know the standard deviation of the list. So Chebyshev's inequality involves the standard deviation uh, and the mean, and it tells you something about how, how many values can be very far away from the mean, up or down, where very far means a multiple of the standard deviation of the list. So we're going to take a break in like a minute and a half, but before we do, can somebody give me other examples of lists that, are, that have to be non-negative, lists where you can't have any negative values? Height. height, okay. Nobody can have a negative height. Age, Age. Nobody's, nobody was born Age. before they were born. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry? Weight, yeah, weights can't be, can't be negative. Unless you fly. Sorry? Unless you fly. Unless you fly. Yeah, no. <laughs> Actually, even things that fly have positive, you know, uh, they just weigh less. Than, uh, um, okay, how long you have to wait for something to happen? How long you have to wait for the bus? You, you, you never get to catch a bus that gets there before you did. 
or leaves it before you get there, something like that, right? Or an elevator or something like that. Other examples? Points in like a football game. Points in a football game, scores, yep. Um, as, is it possible for a penalty to make your score negative in, in those games? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm missing the team sports gene completely and utterly. I just. Uh, um, Time, okay, so uh, like yeah, waiting time, yeah, how long you have to wait for something, yes, but time differences could be negative, yeah, so it varies, so. Prices. Prices, rarely are you paid to take something away. Yeah. Okay, so that's the kind of situation where Markov's inequality might be helpful to have some idea of how large could values be, how many values could be as large or larger than some threshold if you know something about the mean of the list and you know that the list can't have any negative elements. All right. Why don't we take 90 seconds to stretch our legs and come back and do some more. Uh, Markov's inequality says if you have a list of numbers and none of the numbers is negative, then you can't have a whole lot of numbers that are a whole lot bigger than the mean. Why? Well, because if you had a whole lot of numbers that were really big, the mean would be bigger, right? It, it sort of it would drag the mean with it. Chebyshev's inequality says if you have a list of numbers, not very many of them can be very far away from the mean where far away is measured as a multiple of the standard deviation. Why is that? Well, because if they were, the standard deviation would be bigger. So in some sense, making numbers be far away from the mean drags the standard deviation with it, just like making numbers much, much bigger than the mean drags the mean with it. Um, you, you can't have a lot of them there, or the mean would have been bigger. You can't have a lot of things far away from the mean, or the standard deviation would be bigger. All right, so what does Chebyshev's inequality say? It says that uh, the fraction of numbers in a list that are a multiple k of the standard deviation or more away from the mean of the list is no bigger than 1 over k squared. So the fraction of elements of a list that are two standard deviations or more away from the mean is no more than 1 over 2 squared, a quarter. The fraction that are more than, that are three or more standard deviations away from the mean is no more than one over three squared, a ninth, okay, and, and so on. And it's true for all, for all k. It's interesting for k bigger than one. Is that okay? Always ask it that way. Uh, it's stalling. <clears throat> really hard. Okay, so, um, Let's look at just a computational example. Uh, suppose that we have a group of students and their mean weight is 140 pounds with a standard deviation of 30 pounds. What fraction of the students weigh between 90 and 190 pounds? All right. How do we get traction on this? Well, we need to see whether we can express that range from 90 to 190 as the mean plus or minus some number of standard deviations. Right? We want to express that range as mean plus or minus some standard deviations. And then we know that the fraction, what, what, what is, Chebyshev's inequality is going to tell us something about the fraction that can be more than a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean. It's going to say that that can't be very big. And so what's that going to tell us about the, about the fraction of numbers that are within that number of standard deviations? It's, it can't be too small. Right? So you, you can't, you're not losing very much when you go far away. You, so you have to have quite a bit of the, quite a few of the observations in the middle. Um, all right, so 
140, if 140 is the mean, what's the range 90 to 190? To get from 140 down to 90 is subtracting 50, yes? To get from 140 up to 190 is adding 50. So that is a symmetrical range around the mean. It's the mean plus or minus something. And we want to express that something as a multiple of the standard deviation. Okay, if the standard deviation is 30 pounds, then 50 is how many 30s? One and two-thirds 30s, right? So the range plus or minus 50 is plus or minus one and two-thirds standard deviations. Is this, is that, is this okay? All right, so the fraction of numbers in the list that are above 190 or below 90, the fraction that are k or more standard deviations from, from the mean, is at most 1 over k squared, where k is 1 and 2 thirds, right? We're looking at, so the fraction that's outside is no bigger than, than this ratio, which is 36%. So what can we say about the fraction that's within the range 90 to 190? Yeah, it's at least 100% minus that, right? So it's at least 64%. This, any question? <laughs> All right, um, you will often encounter a problem where you can use more than one inequality. And what you, the one that you should use is the one that gives you the sharpest answer. What does sharp mean for an inequality? If you're trying to find an upper bound on something, the smaller the upper bound is, the more informative it is, right? It's sharper. If you're trying to find a lower bound on something, the larger the lower bound is, the more informative it is. Saying that something can't be less than five is not as useful as saying it can't be less than zero, right? So the larger the lower bound, the more informative it is. The smaller the upper bound, the more informative it is. Sharper is another word. There's, I've heard someone define a mathematician as, a mathematician is someone who prefers an inequality to an equality. Um, and, and there's actually something to that, that inequalities are somehow much deeper than equations. Equations are just identities. Inequalities are somehow, there's, there's more going on. All right, so here's a particular example of a problem that uh, you can apply both Markov's inequality to and Chebyshev's inequality to, and one's going to give a better answer. And so let's just look at how, how it works out. By the way, people watch any of the construction that was going on on the Bay Bridge and uh, on the, the bridge cam or whatnot? You know, doesn't matter, anybody's life now. Interesting. Okay, so uh, we're gonna say that on average it takes 45 minutes to cross the Bay Bridge during rush hour with a standard deviation of 15 minutes. And so we're gonna imagine some very long list of travel times, how long it took to cross the bridge. And in this very long list of, of numbers, the average of that list is 45 minutes, the standard deviation of the list is 15. We want to ask, what's the largest fraction of numbers in that list that could be bigger than two hours? Two hours or bigger. Okay. So travel time across the bridge, you never arrive before you leave. So that's a list of, of non-negative numbers, right? Okay. Um, and Markov's inequality says that the fraction of elements of a list, if the list doesn't have any negative elements, fraction that's bigger than some constant is no bigger than the mean of the list divided by that constant. So the mean of the list is 45 minutes, the constant is two hours, 45 minutes over 120 minutes is 37 and a half percent. Okay, so Markov's inequality says, and it, you know, it's got to be true, that no more than 37 and a half percent of the elements of that list are bigger than two hours. Okay. Well, we can also apply Chebyshev's inequality to the same problem because we know the mean and we know the standard deviation. So we can figure out what fraction of elements of the list could be really, really big or really, really small. Now, the fraction that are really, really big or really, really small can't be any smaller than the fraction that are really, really big because you're taking the fraction really, really big and you're adding something to it. It can't be negative, right? So. If we use Chebyshev's inequality, which says can't have too much stuff out there, and say can't have too much out there means can't have too much up there. That makes sense? We've got, we've got 
these, the inequalities chain. All right, so first we need to figure out what range of values we're talking about. So two hours is 120 minutes. How many standard deviations from the mean is that? Well, the standard deviation is 15 minutes. To go from 45 minutes to two hours takes five 15 minutes, right? It's 15 minutes times five is, is 75 minutes. 75 minutes plus 45 minutes is two hours. All right? So <clears throat> the, this, this bound, the, 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 the threshold we're looking for of two hours is the mean plus five times the standard deviation. So the fraction that are more than five standard deviations away from the mean is at least as big as the fraction that's more than five standard deviations above the mean. Chebyshev's inequality bounds the first thing. The first thing has to bound the second thing. Does that make sense? You're not? OK. So um, in fact, it's going to do a little bit better job here because we know that the list can't have any elements that are five standard deviations below the mean because five standard deviations below the mean is negative 30 minutes. So we know that there aren't any elements of the list that are where it took you less than minus 30 minutes to cross the bridge, right? That doesn't happen. So, all right, so what does Chebyshev's inequality tell you? What well, says the fraction of elements of that list that are less than minus 30 or bigger than 120 is no larger than one over five squared because that's a range that is beyond, that is five standard deviations or more from the mean. One over five squared is a 25th, that's 4%. That's a much, much, much better bound than 37.5%. They're both true, right? If you can't have more than 4% really big, then it's certainly true that you can't have more than 37.5% really big. But knowing that you can't have 4% is more informative than knowing that you can't have more than 37.5%. So it's sharper. There will be some, yes? When you mark that inequality, when you say that your, is it your cutoff is two hours, then how can you say two hours is longer? Like, aren't you computing for that two hours and making it all the smaller values as, like, as small as they can be so that you can account for those two hours? OK, so the, the question is, in Marcos inequality, aren't you sort of assuming that things are exactly two hours? And so how can you say two hours or more? Um, and wh why does it work that way? So the, the inequality does this. What it's bounding is what fraction can be two hours or above. And the question is, what makes that as large as possible? And what makes that as large as possible would be if they were all exactly two hours. But if you, that doesn't mean that, so what makes the inequality sharp is if the list only had two numbers in it, zero and two hours. Okay, so that's where, you know, if the list were of that sort with only two values, zero and two hours, then you could have exactly 37.5% of the numbers at two hours. And, that, and at two hours is two hours and above. Okay, for any other list, if you have more than two values, then the amount that you have above two hours is going to be less than 37.5% of, of, of the elements. OK, so it's still an upper bound. But the way that you get what makes it sharp is if the list only has two elements. Otherwise, there's slack. It would be the, the way it would be said. Okay. Other questions? OK, so in the homework and in life, you will have examples where you can apply both Markov's and Chebyshev's inequality uh, in order to, you, you're not going to be able to apply Chebyshev's inequality if you don't know the standard deviation of the list, right? You have to know the standard deviation. You're not going to be able to apply Markov's inequality if you don't know that the list only has numbers bigger than or equal to 0. So there's some ingredients that are sort of necessary for you to use these things. But some problems have all the ingredients for using both of them, in which case the one to use is the one that gives you the more informative answer, the sharper answer, the larger lower bound or the smaller upper bound. <clears throat> all right. Um, yeah, lifetimes, another example of things that, that can't be negative. Yes? It was a, uh, save my political jokes for when I'm not on the camera. Uh, 
Okay. Questions about any of this stuff? All right, we've been talking about one list of numbers at a time, <clears throat> which you think about as sort of one measurement on each of a group of objects, each of a group of subjects. But very often in life, we get to make more than one kind of measurement on each of a group of objects. Like we might measure a given person's height and weight and other stuff, blood pressure and eye color and you know whatever. Um, we might measure someone's years of education and income. We might measure somebody's undergraduate GPA and their uh, score on the GMAT exam. Okay, so there's a lot of situations where we make more than one measurement on each of a collection of individuals. Uh, that's getting into multivariate data from uni univariate data. We've been talking about univariate data so far, now we're talking about multivariate data. So like before, first thing we want to concern ourselves with is how do you look at this stuff? What's a good way to represent it to get some mental picture of what's going on? And then we'll talk about how do you summarize it with some small number of numbers? How do you summarize these multivariate observations? How do you reduce them so that you can get, wrap your mind around them more easily? So a um, data set that we're going to talk about, this is a, another one of our sample data sets. These are Measurements on a handful of variables for, is it 800 and, I've forgotten how many students it is, uh, 913 uh, business students who went on to one of five uh, quote unquote good business schools. So these were undergraduate business, these were undergraduate majors, went on to business school, and what do we have measurements for them, uh, measurements of for these 913 individuals? We have an indicator of which of the five schools they ended up going to, what their verbal GMAT score was, what their quantitative GMAT score was, what their undergraduate GPA was, and what their first year MBA GPA was. Okay, so we've got a handful of variables for each of 913 students. So there's a histogram of their verbal GPA, verbal GMATs rather. There's a histogram of their quantitative GMATs. You know, there's their undergraduate GPAs, blah, blah, blah. So this doesn't, I mean, a question I might be, suppose I'm an admissions director for a business school. I might be interested in predicting who's going to do well in business school based on their undergraduate GPA, their GMAT scores, because I might use that as a criterion for figuring out whom to admit. Yes? All right. So I might be interested in what's the association between undergraduate GPA and first year MBA GPA, for example. You know, do they tend to go up together? How, how predictive is one of the other, so on. Well, so the, one of the best tools for looking at questions like this is a scatter plot. Each dot on the scatter plot is one of the 913 students. So a dot is an individual. And on one axis, we're plotting one of the variables for that, those individuals. On the other, we're plotting another variable. So in this particular case, on the vertical axis, we've got the quantitative GMAT score. And on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we've got the verbal GMAT score. Okay. Generally, there's a, well, first of all, there's a lot of scatter for these 913 students. But generally, there's sort of an upward trend to what's, what's going on. People who did better, did better on the quantitative also tended to do better on the verbal. Okay, um, let's look at uh, first year MBA GPA versus undergraduate GPA. <clears throat> All right, um, so these kind of bunch up in the corner. Why do they bunch up in the corner? Okay, they're, they're, they're skewed to the left. What, what makes them skewed to the left? Right. How high can you get? Okay, you can get to a four. 
Students going to one of five good business schools, are they going to be closer to a zero GPA or closer to a four GPA? Yeah, okay. So you got people who are, you know, coming very close to maxing out the rating scales, and some of them aren't. Many of them are. And then some of them drift off to the left. So you have this skew to the left that, that, that you, were, you were talking about. All right. Again, generally a bit of a positive trend, I would say, right, that sort of uh, you, you have, well, I mean, you've got some low values on, on both. Um, all right, let's, let's play with this a little bit. So first of all, this is a new tool. And let's look at some of the features of the tool. If I do list data, um, this is going to bring up all of the observations. So in this case, School is the first column, first year MBA GPA is the next column, verbal GMAT, next quantitative, et cetera, undergraduate GPA. So these, these, these first students in the list, these are all school one. We get to school two at some point on, on three, four, five. Okay. All right, if I click one of these, the corresponding point in the scatter plot turns yellow. And that was over here. This guy turned yellow. If I unclick him, he'll turn back blue again. OK, somebody else is yellow now. All right. Uh, OK, so you can, you can select points and see where they show up in the scatter plot. You can also plot univari univariate statistics for these things, summary statistics. So for the, variable, for, the, for the verbal GMAT, there are 913 cases. That's the mean, standard deviation, smallest, largest, median, upper quartile, maximum, lower quartile, medium, upper quartile, maximum. Okay? And, and you get that for all, all the variables in the data set. So you, you're not going to have to go through a list of however many baseball salaries again by hand and pick out the maximum. Right? That's, that, was, that was to remind you that software is helpful. Um, Okay, so first of all, who's this? <laughs> all right, this is an undergraduate GPA of one point something. <laughs> right? And the person got into one of five good business schools. There are a number of hypotheses that present themselves at this juncture. <laughs> Could be a data transcription error, right? That might be just wrong. I mean, that might not be that person's actual undergrad GPA, right? What are some other hypotheses? He knows somebody who knows somebody, yeah. <laughs> His last name is Haas. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, what are some other hypotheses? Yeah. Okay, they might have done really, really good on tests. So let's let's probe that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what do we know? We know that this per the, that the the undergraduate GPA is down around one point something. All right. So undergraduate GPA is this rightmost column. So let's see if we can find the one. Holler if you see it. Uh, well, this, I think this is one, and then that's 1.2. So it's one point something. Uh, Find this person. There it is. All right, okay, there they are. All right, so let's look at what their other scores were. Okay, the first of all, first year MBA GPA was not high, but you know, was certainly a lot better than a lot of other people, right? I mean, th these people did much, much worse with much higher undergraduate GPAs, right? So this wasn't a if that really was somebody with a 1.1, it wasn't a silly decision to admit him or her, right? That, a posteriori. <clears throat> um, okay, so 33 
So now we've got this person selected, and we can actually change the variables that we're displaying. So let's look at what their verbal GMAT score is. OK, verbal GMAT score was, OK, this red square here is called the point of averages. And the coordinates of that point are the average of what's being plotted on the x-axis versus the average of what's being pointed on, plotted on the y-axis. OK, it's not, an, it's not a datum. It's the averages. OK, so this person ended up, this person did a little below average on the verbal GMAT. So exceptional verbal GMAT score is not the explanation. How about quantitative GMAT? Again, roughly average on the quantitative GMAT. So good hypothesis, but data says no. All right, didn't, didn't blow the doors off the exams. All right. Another hypothesis. Donated some money for the school, <laughs> bought, bought their way in. OK, it's certainly possible, all right? Um, could be a student who has been out of school for some time, working in the world, you know, is a VP somewhere and wants to go back and get an MBA. OK, so there could be a very big time lag between so that the undergraduate GPA is just not relevant factor anymore. Yeah, that, there, there are people like that. Um, could have phenomenal letters of recommendation. We don't have any data on the letters of recommendation here, right? Something could have gone wrong in one semester in that student's career, and the, the overall GPA might not be a good measure of how that student actually did. They might have done phenomenally well their senior year and all their upper division classes, so forth and so on. They just had a really lousy freshman year and sophomore year and half the junior year. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> OK, but you get the idea that we can start probing some of these questions from a display of data like this. That's, that's kind of where we're, where we're trying to go. Now, um, there's a lot of scatter in these data. You really can't do a very good job of predicting for this list, these 913 students, you can't do a very good job of predicting what their first year MBA GPA is going to be from any of these other variables. Because the scatter in a strip, we look at a particular slice through here, right? These are all the people now whose undergraduate GPA was between 2 and 2.2, right? We look at a slice there. Their first year MBA GPAs are kind of all over the place, right? Look at a slice over here between, say, 3.6 and 3.8. On average, they're doing a little better than those who are down there, but they're still all over the place, right? There's an awful lot of scatter in the data. This variable is not doing a very good job of helping us predict what the other variable is going to be. So if that's the case, why should an admissions officer care what your undergraduate grades are? All right, so let's think about how you get to be a dot on this plot. How do you get to be in this data set? Yeah, you had to have gotten into one of those top five business schools, five high quality business. It's not the top five, it's sort of five good business schools. Um, OK. So that decision was based in part on these variables and your letters of recommendation and your personal statement and a whole bunch of other things, right? So if you get in at all, it's because they think you're going to do well, right? You have already gotten in in order to end up on this plot. Yes? So they may be able to do a very good job from these same variables plus letters, et cetera, of predicting that people are going to do poorly. And they don't admit them. And so they don't end up showing up. So you don't get a whole lot of points down in here that would make the association look a lot stronger. Okay? So the, there, there's a censoring going on. There's, sort of a, there's a selection effect that to, get in, to be on this plot, you already have to have gotten in. The decision to let you in was based on these variables and a bunch of others. And to the extent to which. 
people's performances are more or less the same after they've passed the filter, that's kind of saying that the admissions office is doing a pretty good job of filtering people because whatever criteria they're applying, even though some of them have lower undergraduate GPAs, some of them have lower GMAT scores, some of them have lower this, some of them have lower that, they end up doing about the same when they get there. So it somehow means that they're maybe doing a good job of balancing all these criteria and deciding whom to admit. Okay, let, just for grins, let's do the following, which is plot school. Okay, so the claim is that these are five quote unquote good schools, but their average, let me plot it the other way around. Let's plot undergraduate GPA. When I, if I do undergrad GPA versus undergrad GPA, what am I gonna see? Straight line, right? Okay. Okay. Um, they're nominally good schools, but it does not look like they're admitting from exactly the same pool. Some are, are admitting people who have typically a higher, a higher average GPA than others. Here's our friend. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, another feature of this thing that you need to be aware of is if you mouse over something, you can read off the coordinates here. Okay. So um, we're now going to talk about qualitative features of multivariate data sets, excuse me, that you can read off of a scatter plot. You can infer from the scatter plot. So this is an example of something we would call something we would call a football shaped scatter plot. L roughly speaking, the data are shaped like a cigar. Okay, they fill a, a you know a sort of oblong region in 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 this space. Um, the scatter in any vertical strip is about the same. There's no obvious curvature going on. Um, it's, it kind of follows a, you know, it's scattered around a straight line and the scatter in different slices is about the same. <clears throat> this is best case scenario for doing regression. Right? This scatter plot shows nonlinear association. The data are not just sort of evenly scattered around a straight line, they're sort of scattered around something that curves in a very pronounced way. Okay. <clears throat> this is an illustration of heteroscedasticity. Hetero means different, scedasticity, scatter. So this, these data have different scatter depending on where you take a vertical slice through. Here, the, the scatter is small, here the scatter is large heteroscedastic. Football shaped scatter plot is linear and homoscedastic. Those are the two features that make it football shaped. Okay, linear association, homoscedasticity. In this case, the, the first you know, thing, I the nonlinear association, that was still homoscedastic. This is now linear but heteroscedastic. <clears throat> linear association, heteroscedastic. Okay, this is an example of an outlier. Okay, what's an outlier? Well, it's a point that is very different from the bulk of the data, very far away in some sense. Okay. What is the outlier? Uh, it might be real, it might be an error, you might need to worry about what to do with it. it might, usually outliers call for additional investigation, but you don't automatically throw them away. Okay, they they're can, they're can carry a lot of information. <clears throat> All right, this is a different sort of outlier. So here, this point, is kind of in the range of values of x, but for other values, it, it sort of is, follows a very different pattern. The data all follow a pattern. This is off the pattern. <clears throat> all right. Um, let's look at this briefly. These are some data from the census. Um, looking forward to updating this with 2010 census data soon. Um, okay, we're looking at education uh, in the 50 states in the District of Columbia. 
And there, this is divided into a variety of slices uh, through the population. Didn't finish ninth grade, ninth through twelfth grade, high school grad, college, but took some college, didn't get a degree, got an associate of arts degree, got a bachelor's degree, got an advanced degree. Okay, so here we are for the 50 states and DC, and we're looking at a scatter plot of some college, went to college, didn't get a degree, divided by the total population, versus the total population. Okay, these are, these are each normalized by 1,000 just to make the numbers more reasonable. So who's that? These are, so there's, how many, how many points are here? 51, right? 50 states plus District of Columbia. Which state has the largest population? Whoops, I meant to, I meant to click that. Okay, that's us, right? We're the biggest. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, are these data linear? They follow, they, they just follow, have linear association? Yeah, generally this is, you know, if you put it, you could, you could pretty much put a straight line through this. You think you'd underestimate that a little bit. Okay, are they homoscedastic or heteroscedastic? So I'm hearing, I'm hearing some of each. All right, if we take a slice through the data down here, is there much scatter? No. no, there's a lot of points that are nearly on top of each other down here. We take a slice over here, there's a lot more vertical scatter in the data. These are, these are actually heteroscedastic, okay? But less scatter down low than up high. It's kind of like the variability increases as the raw count increases. Okay? There, there are a lot of phenomena that are, that are sort of like this, but uh, Count data is is often that way. Okay. Um, I had a question. I was wondering, um, when you say like homo and homo skedastic and homo skedastic, does it matter like which way it's scattering? Like, is it, like say like the, the top of 40 kind of like the scatter was less as it, as it went up higher? Does it matter? Okay, so the question is does it matter uh, which way it goes for homo skedastic versus hetero skedastic that this one? It, uh, it, it doesn't matter that more scatter was on the right and less scatter was on the left. What matters is that if you take a vertical slice through this stuff, some vertical slices have a lot less scatter than other vertical slices. When you try to eyeball the amount of scatter that there is in a vertical slice, you need to take into account how many points there are in that slice. So here, I mean, if I if, if I made the slice so narrow that I only got these two points, it wouldn't look like much scatter at all. But there's clearly kind of typically what's going on. The standard deviation of the values in a reasonably sized slice is staying about the same. It gets a little wider in the middle where there are more points. But still, if I looked at like how wide would a band need to be to capture kind of two thirds of them, that would be about the same width band as I, as I move up, okay? So scatter is not, I mean, there's only one point in this slice. It has no scatter because one point doesn't have any scatter. But you're kind of, you know, on average, it's about, it's about the same amount everywhere. That's, that's kind of what you expect in a football shaped scatter plot. This, this figure is very different, okay? People are moving towards the door. I think we have another th three minutes. I'm gonna try to get a little bit further. Okay. Um, what this plot has done is we've taken the point of averages and gone plus or minus one standard deviation above and below the point of averages, both in the x direction and in the y direction. Okay. Um, so this is just you know kind of carving out a chunk of data in the middle. Um, we can we can start to think about summarizing bivariate data, but bivariate meaning two variables. So in this case, we're looking at quantitative and verbal GMAT. Um, we can summarize the quantitative GMAT by its mean and its standard deviation and the verbal GMAT by its mean and its standard deviation. But that's not telling us anything about the fact that this thing generally tends to slope up, right? 
So what we're trying to get to now is a measure of association that tells us something about not just the variables individually, but how they're associated, how they behave together, how, how one tends to vary with the other. Now, association and causation are very, very different from each other. We're going to talk about that at length. But if thinking to this example, if I, um, the, let me, let's do this just really briefly. Um, if I look at my first year MBA GPA versus my undergraduate GPA, right? Typically, you know, on the whole, with some exceptions, especially down here, people who did better tended in one tended to do better in the other, right? If I had somehow gotten one more question right on my final exam in statistics and that had boosted my GPA by a point, you know, a fraction of a point, would that have caused me to do better in grad school? No. Okay. I mean, it's sort of, so changing one variable doesn't cause the other to change. We're just looking at what happened for these people. They, you know, they got a certain undergrad G GPA. They got a certain first year MBA GPA. We're not thinking about manipulating one, altering one deliberately and seeing what happens to the other. So we're looking at association, not causation. We'll talk about this uh, in great length as the term goes on. See you guys.